It's the BBP TV show since 2012, where amazing guests share their digital adventures. Who will we meet today? Small biz influencer? Up and coming trendsetter? Accomplished author? You never know who'll be dropping by. And now, here's your host, Elaine Lindsay, the bionic glamourpreneur with true social media, who's the second most curious person on the planet. My guest is Cindy Watson, the founder of Women on Purpose. She's also the founder and managing partner of Watson Labor Law. She's a graduate of the prestigious Osgood Hall, and Cindy is an experienced and respected attorney. For the past 30 years, she specialized in social justice. Cindy's a sought after trainer and speaker in the corporate arena as well, helping to build bridges between men and women in order to aid in productivity, communication, and to heal gender bias, dedicated to breaking down barriers, securing pay equity, and to ending discrimination. Cindy has a proven track record, empowering, advocating, and motivating people to become the best version of themselves. Now, as a coach for women who want to learn the art of feminine negotiation, what Cindy calls how to get what you want from the boardroom to the bedroom. Cindy speaks internationally and is an award-winning author as well. She's a consultant, and in all these areas, she's known for her passion, commitment, and ability to inspire. We're going to talk about her ideals, her perspective, her passions, and her new purpose planner. So without further ado, let's get to it. And so with my guest, Cindy Watson, we're going to have a great discussion today about all the things Cindy's done in her career and all the passions Cindy has mm. that we're really going to be delving deeper into. All about women on purpose. And I will say Cindy is absolutely a woman on purpose. Thank you. <laughs> good, good to have you here, Cindy. I yes. Thanks, Elaine. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for the invite. I'm really looking forward to it. Oh, I'm so glad. I'm so glad. I want to be sure that we sort of touch on all of the bits because you have such a really um, full resume that's <laughs> super interesting and it does all lead you to Women on Purpose. I totally get that and we want to share that with the viewer. But um, I think we'll sort of start in the middle and we'll work Backwards and forwards. That's okay. <laughs> okay. With you. Well, I knew you were my kind of woman. <laughs> <laughs> so, you were a lawyer, a labor lawyer. Yes. Yes. So, can you explain a little bit more about what exactly does that encompass? Yeah, it's a great question because I most people get labor and employment law confused. So it's a very specialized niche. And I, I've more recently been calling myself a social justice lawyer, but the bulk of my practice was labor law. And within labor law, that's basically law that centers around relationships where there were collective bargaining. So people typically either represented the management side or the trade union side. And having come from blue collar roots myself, my uh, practice was always specializing in trade union labor law. The reason I say social justice, though, is that I also did a lot of human rights work and anti-discrimination and a lot of women's advocacy work as well. So a, a little bit broader, but the bulk of my practice was predominantly labor law. And that's not usually what you hear from <laughs> women lawyers. No. <laughs> I, I know a lot of lawyers, and I can honestly say you're the only one I know that does labor law. Yeah, and but, that would even more so the case when I started, I must say. I think now you see it much more often, actually. But boy, when I started practicing 30 years ago, I was almost always the only woman in the room. And that includes all of my clients, the adjudicators, everybody on the other side of the table, other than the, the potential witness once in a while who gave, where we were able to get some estrogen in the room. I was normally on my the own. Only woman. <laughs> <laughs> and looking back and, and you did you did allude to the fact that you you grew up blue collar um we both 
did some growing up in Toronto. Yeah. Uh, you were in Scarborough? I think? Scarborough, yes, I am. <laughs> I was in Downsview, and uh, okay. we, we were in a, a very depressed area, yeah. let's say. Yeah. Yeah, I think very similar, similar background, similar, I interesting. I, I think down to you in Scarborough had a lot of similarities, actually. So Yeah, yeah, we had a lot of immigrant families in our, the apart, we lived in apartment buildings. There was a, a, a set of four that backed on the Downs U Dells Park. Okay. And, and it was, it was immigrants and, you know, um, not the people with an awful lot. <laughs> yes, yes. Well, very similar then. I lived in a park complex as well where there were a string of apartments that backed onto the creek. It was on the, the other side of the creek and our side of the creek. We were on the wrong side of the creek. <laughs> well, we had a creek on the other side, yeah, and we were always fighting the kids on the other side of the creek. Yes. <laughs> so funny. <laughs> yeah, it's, fun. it's funny how we, how we um, remember those things from childhood, those, those sort of lines that, that one didn't cross when it came yeah. to other kids. Yeah. It shapes us. It's interesting. You realize, and, and more recently, I'm becoming more and more aware of sort of how our background shapes us and how you have to really bring intention to pushing past the stories about that to, to choose a different path sometimes. Ab absolutely. And that's a really, really good point. So when you first went to law school, was labor law even on the horizon? Nope. <laughs> It wasn't a thing. <laughs> I had to cobble together a curriculum and, and now they do have full curriculums with arbitration courses and full on programming, but they, that did not exist at the time. Ironically, they had the only labor course they had that was called labor law was actually not labor law. It was employment law. Employment law. And it talked about employment standards, but actually had nothing to do with labor law in the actual sense of the term. So I was taking as much as I could in, in terms of administrative law and they had a course on negotiation that I got you know sort of scooped up and anything that I thought would do me well in that practice area so there were an, only a handful of firms that practiced labor law mm -hmm. um, and so I'd sort of hunted that down and so I knew there was that niche existed and now it was just a matter of gearing myself up to be ready to uh, approach them so. and and you, you made an incredible career out of labor law Yes, thank you. I did. And I ended up like I went with one of the traditional firms that was established at the time, all of which were, of course, male dominated firms. Yeah. And I ended up being offered a partnership after only three years, which was very wow. quite the compliment. Yeah. I had a real awakening at the time because I recognized I didn't want to be there. I loved what I did, Elaine. I loved my clients. It fired me up. But I didn't want to be there in that environment. And uh, everyone thought I was having an early midlife crisis because I, <laughs> I did not take it and I left the firm. And uh, I traveled for six months, which I'd never done because I was always so high school to you know university to law school, shooting for those straight A's. And a friend of mine was a travel agent, had been bugging me for years to, to do a big travel. And I'm like, I can't, you just can't do that in law. You can't leave your clients for that. No. Long, you know? So that was this little window I had. I took off. And when I came back, I, the naivete of youth, because in hindsight, I may not have done it, but I'm just like, I'm going to start my own firm. Oh, sure. And I well, put up my shingle. I had, you know, no credit. I had no, you know, guaranteed clients to speak <laughs> of, no equity. And I went to the bank and luckily had this woman uh, manager who took wow. a chance on me got the tiniest in hindsight line of credit to get started. But at the time coming from Scarborough, it seemed like an inordinate amount of money yeah. and it was just enough to get me on my way. And so I've had my own law firm for most of those 30 years now. Wow. Wow. Uh, and, and just to say there's actually two uh, offices. We, you have Bracebridge and you have Toronto and the law practice is still going. Yes. But what, happened what, <laughs> what what big pivotal life moment had you suddenly deciding that you were going to create this incredible space that we now know as women on purpose thank you um, I would say there were a series of them to be honest so I think like looking back in hindsight I think my first sort of 
inkling about this was uh, when my firstborn, uh, you know, we started late and made up for lots of time. We had three kids in three years. <laughs> but yeah, that's right. I, see, I do everything with absolute intensity. Um, but when my daughter was born, my firstborn, at two months old, she got diagnosed with a very serious heart defect. And she had to have open heart surgery and everything that could go wrong went wrong. And we spent almost the next three months in critical care at the hospital for sick kids with wow. me sleeping on a cot, on the floor, on whatever, like literally my world became this big. And I already had my own law firm. So it was a challenge to say the least, yeah. but it also was a real mind shift because you know, up until that point, it's drive, drive, forward, forward, right? And there's so much conflict and so much confrontation in the practice. And, you know, I was known as the Barracuda and my, you know, by my clients and they meant it as a big compliment. And for the longest time, I took it as a compliment, but it was a real epiphany for me being in that hospital and recognizing how my life was so conflict ridden and just this shift of priorities that maybe we've got things wrong here. Maybe this approach, this isn't what life's supposed to be. We get one turn in this body here on this earth. And am I really living a life that's authentic and consistent to who I am and who I was as a kid, which was the person who was the peacemaker. I was the one who was able to bring solutions, always wanted everybody to feel included. And, you know, I was very creative as a child. And, and I felt like I, that was my first inkling, I think, that I'd sort of maybe lost my way somehow. But having said that, we're so conditioned, Lane, just so conditioned. I am embarrassed to say that it still wasn't enough. I went back for, the, for a period I didn't, but you slide back into those same conditioned patterns. Yeah. And then I found for me, it started impacting on my relationships because that kind of, it's almost like this little toxic poison when you're living a life that's all about that kind of competitive approach versus a cooperative approach where you're headbutting all the time, where you leave nothing on the table, that take no prisoners kind of approach to life yeah. and your career, it starts affecting your relationships with your intimate partner with your kids and and with yourself frankly your sense mm -hmm. of self and i remember one pivotal moment that may seem like nothing to so many people but i was having what i thought was a regular discussion with my son and i could see his frustration mounting and i was like what what is going on here i could sense it and at one point he just blew up and he's like for god's sake mom does every discussion with you have to be an argument that you win and it took my breath away. Like it, it felt like someone took my heart and ripped it out and held a mirror up and I did not like what I saw. And a whole bunch of things clicked into place in that moment or in the moments following it. And I remembered back to that negotiation course that I'd taken that I mentioned. And, and not to toot my heart, that was a course where we were basically bargaining for our marks, which I didn't know or I probably wouldn't have taken the bloody course, <laughs> to be honest. But, I, you know, we got divided into little groups throughout the course of the, uh, the year, and you had your one-hour class session to negotiate a settlement. If you didn't get a settlement, you got a zero. You can imagine how Ooh. that went over in a competitive law school, you know, one wow. of the law schools in Canada. And whoever got the highest negotiated settlement got the highest mark, and so on all the way down. And I won virtually every one of those simulated negotiations. And I'm not saying that to brag, but because it wasn't until after that interaction with my son, with one of my boys, that I remembered back to that negotiation course. And you know what? I wasn't the Barracuda then. I did not come to those negotiations with a no prisoners or get every last dime on the table. I came from a place that... I would call a more feminine place of power in hindsight, where it was all about rapport building and empathy and it, trusting my intuition and building trust. I'm like, we've only got an hour. What do you need? Let me see what I can give you. Let's sort it. And I realized that I got so far away from that, being in this male dominated industry and a male dominated niche within that industry where I was led to believe or chose to believe that the only way to succeed in that environment was to bring that same masculine competitive energy. And it was like a light went off. I suddenly realized, you know what? You don't have to do that to succeed. And it became a real mission. And that combined with the political climate at the time, mm -hmm. um, I just felt like women were losing ground very quickly yeah. in ways that surprised me was perhaps naively. And I was feeling this dissatisfaction where I, where I was at. And as I started giving voice to that, 
I recognized I wasn't alone. It was universal. Yeah. So many women who had very successful lives and careers and families were feeling this hole that something was missing. And of course, being women, we felt we then feel guilty that we feel dissatisfied. Yeah, yeah. And that's when this just became my driving mission to make a difference to help women really pursue their passion, rediscover their passion and purpose so they could live on purpose and with purpose, but also to step into their power, recognizing that as a, the feminine power of negotiation, if you will. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and we are definitely getting to the feminine power of negotiation because I'm going to tell you on top of everything else, I held it back because I wanted to present it a little later. <laughs> Cindy's also an author. Because, I mean, you want, you want something done, you want people to <laughs> succeed, give it to a very busy person. That's so true. And, and we have you right in front of me. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I have to ask, having said she's an author, this is going to be an interesting little meander. <laughs> you wrote a book on animals. Yes, misunderstood animals. Yeah. Misunderstood animals, <laughs> which I think is amazing. And then you wrote a book about Jeff Healy. Yes, because yeah, those two things are so obviously connected. Well, absolutely. <laughs> Labor lawyer, mis <laughs> mishandle animals, and Jeff Healy, but of course. <laughs> So you want to know how that happened? <laughs> I certainly do. <laughs> um, when I was young, and one of the thing, one of the other missions that I have on Women on Purpose is that I feel so strongly that women often don't follow their own purpose and their own dreams and their own vision in life because we're conditioned to do what others expect of us. Mm -hmm. We're conditioned to take care of everybody's needs above our own. You know, we're so conditioned about how we need to show up in the world, how we look, how we, you know, act, what we feel, how, our very <laughs> sense of being. And, and in my own personal situation, as a child, I loved creativity. I loved to sing. I loved to dance. I loved to act. I remember in grade four, I wrote a play for our school Christmas pageant. You know, I mean, I just, I had a passion for the arts. And it was in hindsight, not too subtly discouraged because... Yeah you know, it would be a great hobby, any of those, but that's not the kind of thing that you pursue as a career. And come on, Cindy, you get great marks in school. You have the ability to be a professional and especially coming where you come from, what a coup that is to have that respect of being a professional. So this sort of not too subtle indoctrination that leads us to follow the path that we know will make our parents proud, our community yes. proud, our, you know, to meet those expectations of everyone in our life. And we tamp down our own creative passions and I pursued law with a vigor and didn't was not engaged in my creative juices for a very long time and it was after I had kids which again happened much later in life I didn't even meet my husband until I was in my uh, early to mid 30s and then as I say we got married and had three kids in three years and I love reading and you know I used to love writing as a kid um, but I had lost that for a very, very long time. And when I started reading to the kids again and engaging that, I'm like, I'm going to write the kids each a story. And once I tapped into that again, I was like, oh, I miss this. <laughs> I miss this outlet. It made my heart sort of beat again. And so then I started really getting a little more serious about doing some writing and realized that getting published in the traditional way is not so easy as I had expected. Ooh. But I, if I'm nothing if not driven, and so I started writing some articles for magazines, and one thing led to another, and I got commissioned uh, to write a book about these misunderstood animals, yes. um, which I actually did happen to feel passionately about as well. Yeah. So I took, you know, and, and it was targeted for a young audience, which fit my, at the time I wanted to write for kids because I had young kids. So I wrote Misunderstood Animals. Uh, it was an educational book. And then I, I, at the same time, I, or around the same time, I happened to meet Jeff Healy. And uh, my husband grew up with him. They were very close friends. Um, and his, my, my father-in-law was best friends with Jeff Healy's adoptive father. So, oh, wow. Yeah, they stood up in each other's wedding. There's this whole history there. But I had never met him. And it was Jeff Healy's 40th birthday. I went to the birthday party. 
And I thought, wow, like I just, watching him work that room was so impressive and his talent, such raw, incredible talent. And I didn't know at the time that he was sick. Uh, he did, but I did not. And he ended up dying not long after yeah. that. Yeah. And I thought at the time, you know what, I should interview Jeff. He'd be, it'd be a great article for a magazine was what I was thinking at the time. And when he died and I heard all of the stories about him and what he stood for, I thought, what an amazing book to write for kids who won't know who the heck Jeff Healy yeah. is, but what he stood for, like to, to have a message without being preachy to kids that you can be and do anything you want in life, to believe no in yourself, about overcoming adversity, keeping a positive attitude in the face of, you know, adversity and and to not be so whiny and entitled, to be yeah. honest. But, so that's how the Jeff Healy book was born. It was written for kids, but ironically ended up winning the Forest of Reading Golden Oaks Award, which is an adult literacy program. So that was a very nice and humbling surprise. So that's, that's the story behind those two completely disconnected from everything else in my life <laughs> books. But I think what it really shows is each and everything that you're passionate about, you give 100%. Oh, I love that. And that is true. I do. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I wanted to be sure that, that we got that out there because you're also, I believe, the founder of the Muskoka Writers Association. Yeah, Muskoka Authors Association. Authors, sorry, yeah. authors. I, I always say writers. And <laughs> Same thing. <laughs> Yes, I found it up here. I felt there's a lot of talent up here and a lot of uh, creative types who come to Muskoka, but really no forum uh, for them to be able to share. And writing can be such a lonely endeavor. Yeah. So it yeah. has been such a blessing, I think, to the community, and I've got so much out of it as well. So we bring you know, famous, well-established authors. We put on workshops. We have monthly meetings together and uh, pretty regular workshops. We bring in publishers and agents so that people can have access in a community where otherwise they wouldn't get it. So it's absolutely. Amazing. And I think, is it a, is it a challenge? The, the book in a weekend? Oh, the Muskoka novel marathon. Yes. yes the marathon. Yes. Done that with my daughter, which has been such yeah. so much fun because she loves to write as well. So for the last four years now, we've done the Muskoka Novel Marathon where you have 40 writers who come together in a weekend. Now, I'm not responsible for that. It predated me, <laughs> but I am very active now. And you come together in 72 hours and you write a complete novel or try <laughs> in, in 72 hours. And it's, it's, uh, it's a great event. And all the money goes to raising funds for adult literacy, which is just so it's a win-win all around <laughs> absolutely absolutely well I think that can give our viewer a better idea of <laughs> just what this lovely lady is capable of some would call it scattered <laughs> oh my <laughs> heaven like, never like multi-directional <laughs> yes well in actual fact um I have been told by a very good source that you, uh, myself, and this other person, we are multi-potentialites. I love that term. <laughs> yeah, it, it means you don't have to only follow one thing. Yeah, I love that. And I, I don't know about you, but when you were talking about, you know, being creative as a child and kind of having that tamped down to do something that made the parents more comfortable and, and yeah. seemed to be, you know, something that would make you secure, mm -hmm. which of course is what our parents want for us. Absolutely. You know, that, that, that one direction was always what, what people aspired to. Yeah. And I know in my own case, I felt what's wrong with me. I don't ever want to yeah. do just one thing. You do it till you're really, really good at it. And then you yeah. do something else. <laughs> <laughs> and that culture is changing, which is which I yeah, think is great. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah, and I think we, we're actually seeing more and more the millennials and this next Gen Z are are much more open yeah. to you know to, to doing and trying many new things. They're not you know logged into one thing forever. Yeah, which I think is a is a great thing. Yeah. And but I love that brings that us. potential light because yeah. it, at that I. It, on another level as well, it's about 
I think we all love to see the potential in things as well. Yeah. So it's not only yeah. having the potential to try different things, but seeing the infinite potential all around us all yeah. the time, which is yeah. so exciting. And being open to that. Yes, I love that. Yeah, yeah. And, and uh, I, thought it was a, I thought it was an incredible, uh, an incredibly uplifting way to look at something I had always assumed was a bit of a problem. Yeah, my I being would proudly flighty. call myself a multi potentialite. I love it. <laughs> Me too. And and hats off to Robin Blackburn McBride, nice. who is an author and yeah. uh, an incredible human being, Beautiful. who gave me that to work with. I love it. So, women on purpose. I'd like you to give women, and and the viewer a, a really good idea of what it encompasses. And I know that there's a book, another book coming. <laughs> and um, well, there's another something else coming even sooner, but we'll get to that a little bit later. Okay, well, it's, uh, it has definitely evolved, uh, which I love, because I think to stay relevant and alive and really reach its full potential, it has to evolve. Mm -hmm. So the original impetus for Women on Purpose, as I say, was more a sense of wanting to really help women to rediscover and rekindle their passion and their purpose because so many of them like when I even talk about women on purpose and they're like what does that even mean you know when you talk about stepping into living a life on purpose and with purpose you know some of them feel embarrassed say I, I don't even know what that means Cindy and ironically I was sitting beside a woman on the plane recently and we got talking about what I do and she sat back and she's like you know what I have no idea what my purpose is yeah. or what I would even pick as that. So I, I sent her a free little video series to, to help her sort of kickstart because for me, it's so important to be able to tap. I, I don't care what stage of life you're at. I, I don't care if you're sort of from eight to 80 plus or 108, frankly, you know, just it is never too late no. to rediscover your purpose and to tap into doing something that you're passionate about and that best utilizes your unique gift, which I believe we all have unique gifts. So originally it started with that mandate and I created some programs around how do you tap in and rediscover their unique gift if you think you've forgotten it or don't know what it is. And, you know, some confidence boosting videos as well, programs and how I wrote a there's a free ebook available on our website as well about how, you know, to, how to be a woman on purpose, the woman on purpose blueprint and talking a little bit about some of the limiting beliefs that have stopped us traditionally from pursuing our purpose and a whole bunch of exercises and mindset shifts about how you can break out of that. So that was the initial impetus. And it's interesting because people kept saying, why aren't you bringing in some of your law background or your business background? And I, I got to admit, I resisted it. I think I was wanting such a fresh break. I resisted yeah. it for a long time. But I finally had my epiphany moment where I recognized that those same things that are holding women back from achieving their purpose are some of the same limiting beliefs that stop them from believing they're effective negotiators. Mm -hmm. And that broke my heart because for me, all of life is a negotiation, whether you're yes. negotiating with your intimate partner, with your kids, with the local car dealer, you know, whether you're big corporate deals, negotiating with yourself, it is probably the single most important skills that we'll ever learn. And yet we're not taught it. Or to the extent that we're taught it, we're taught that negotiation is all about the bark and the bite. And I bet if you ask your listeners, the vast majority of them will think the person who's the toughest is going to win the day. The person who speaks the loudest and or the longest is the person who's going to be the most successful at negotiations. And it is simply not true. So that led me to found to, to sort of come up with the create a program that I call the art of feminine negotiation. Yes. And that has certainly evolved as a really fundamental component of women on purpose. So, absolutely, and um, for for the viewer, you will be able to link up to the blog on women on purpose, where you will find a series of really great posts that all have to do with the feminine art of negotiation. As a matter of fact, Cindy's writing a book on the feminine art of negotiation. <laughs> I am. The art of feminine negotiation, how to get what you want from the boardroom to the bedroom. So there I'm hoping go. that will catch people's attention. <laughs> well, it certainly should. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I think, no, I think it's incredibly important. And, and it is something that we, we have to do 
Yeah. You know, nobody gets their own way all the time. It doesn't make any sense. So you have to be able to know how to maneuver. And, and you know, it can be challenging with your children or your dog. Well, yes. <laughs> well, the reason I feel so passionately about it, Elaine, as well, is that, like, as I say, I think all of life is a negotiation, such an important skill. And yet I find over and over again, women, most women believe one of two things. Either they step back and shy away because they believe they're not effective negotiators, or they feel that the only way is to overcompensate, like I did for years in my law practice, and bring that what I'll call more masculine energy to the table to succeed. And again, neither are true. And the more I started really exploring and looking into, okay, I've got 30 years under my belt here. What are the markings of a really, truly exceptional negotiator? What are those skill sets that I brought to the table when I was at my best? What are the skill sets from those negotiators who really would give me a run for my money, who were really skilled and effective? And I broke it down to six elements. And I'm happy to share with you, with your listeners, a little new that, that I created. It makes it really easy to remember. It's our fit. Just think you are fit to be a great negotiator. So that's A-R-E-F-I-T. The A is for assertiveness. And I'm going to stop there for a sec because that's where most women immediately get intimidated going, oh, I don't like conflict. I don't want that conflict-laden approach. I'm going to step back. I'm not a great negotiator. And it's a couple of things, let me say about that one. Assertiveness and aggressiveness are not the same thing. And we conflate the two. Assertiveness is actually about coming from a place of knowledge, confidence in your position, which comes from preparation. And again, I don't have, you know, there's a whole series of blogs and, and programming that I've written about that. But suffice it to say, women are great at preparing. We tend to over-prepare. We, we bring that skill set to the table. So the knowledge that you need to be able to be assertive in your position, you don't have to beat your chest. You don't have to bang the table. You don't have to get assertive. You don't have to even have conflict. I often say to people and they're like, oh, do you believe you should stand up and have the upper hand? Nobody is going to move me off my mark if I don't want them to move me off my mark. They can, you know, they can stand on their head for all they can. It's not going to move me off my mark if I don't want to. And I want women to recognize that they have that ability to stand strong in their position in ways that are completely authentic to their natural style, whatever that is. And I also just digress for a moment. I'll come back to the R fit, but on the assertive piece of it, women think, a lot of women think that they're not naturally assertive. But I, I beg to differ, and I'd ask you guys to reframe and think about it. Yeah. A mama bear protecting her cub, you're not going to find someone more assertive to make sure to protect. So I tell, clearly we have the capability of being assertive, but most women will bring that when they're protecting someone else. If they're advocating for a child or an aging parent or any vulnerable population, they bring their game. They bring that assertiveness and they're, they're prepared to stand their ground. Again, they don't have to beat their chest or get aggressive, no. but they're prepared no. to stand their ground and advocate for others in a way that they don't advocate for themselves. So a quick little hot tip I'll throw out here. I often will say to women, if, if you find it challenging, if you're not in the I'm going to overcompensate school and you find it challenging to step into being assertive. And let me just say, whether you're a man or woman, I call it the art of feminine negotiation. This really isn't a gender thing. No. Men and women both have masculine and feminine energy. Yep. I think we're moving away from that language and we'll have different language shortly, but for now it's language yeah. people understand. So I encourage the art of feminine negotiation for men and women. And I just imagine what a different world it would be if everybody came from a place of this more feminine energy and negotiations yeah. rather yeah. than competition. But the tip is the next time you're in a situation where you need to advocate yourself and you're feeling anxious about that, we all have that little bear cub in ourselves, every one of us, that little girl or that little boy with all our little girl, girl hurts that we, or little boy hurts that we still carry around inside of us. So the next time you need to advocate on behalf of yourself, invoke your mama bear for that little bear cub inside you. That is such a subtle mind shift, but I find it can make a really big difference for women. So, so that's the A is assertiveness. The R is for rapport building. And again, women have been great rapport builders for generations. And frankly, they've had to be because we've had so few rights for so long. The only yeah. way we got to exert any control over our life was being really skilled at building rapport. So rapport building. 
Empathy. Again, women tend, if you ask most people, who would you think would be more empathetic? You're, uh, people would immediately associate that with being a more feminine trait. Yeah. Flexibility, yeah. again, of necessity. We're multitaskers by nature. Yes. Women tend to be juggling a hundred balls in the air at any time. We, we end up, you know, with those spinning plates for the proverbial, yeah. we're watching the kids and we're doing this. So we're used to being flexible. It's a skill we apply all the time. Intuition is the eye. They call it women's intuition for a reason. <laughs> I'm just <Absolutely. joking. laughs> So trusting in that intuition and the final one T for trustworthiness. So of those six, assertiveness, rapport building, empathy, flexibility, intuition, and trust, at least five out of six of those, if you surveyed 100 people, the vast majority of those, that family feud game, you know, 100 people surveyed, top yeah. answer is, they would consider those to be well, feminine traits. Yeah. So it's like Dorothy from The Wizard of Oz, Elaine. We, you, you, we've been wearing the ruby red slippers all along. We exercise these traits in a million ways every day. We just don't think of them as negotiating. So just bringing people's awareness to that, that is so the intention good. to it is such a beautiful, beautiful transformation to see. I have to write that down. <laughs> we've been wearing the ruby slippers. Yep. <laughs> Good, 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 good. That's excellent. Thank you. Uh, as you can see, Cindy's very articulate and very passionate <laughs> about women on purpose. It's about living life purposefully yes. and with purpose. And I think it is something that we women have put to the side because we do tend to put everybody else forward I, I know growing up my mother my mother would take whatever was left if there was something left yes. uh, at the end of the month for her needs yeah my mother never put herself first no. ever i know okay it. my dad and and the two kids we were always uh we lacked for nothing we we were dirt poor okay but we didn't really know that yeah. Because, you know, yeah. <laughs> That's you know, so true. <laughs> yeah. Isn't it? Isn't it? Like, yeah. We thought we we thought we were pretty good. Um, <laughs> and, it, and you look back and think, wow, you know, my, my mom and dad actually said, yeah, we came to this country with the clothes on our back. So we, we didn't have a lot. Yeah. But it was not expected for my father to do that. Yes. Yes. Oh, no, um, she would make a point, and and I I have to say, my father my father was is a great man. He never, you know, he didn't go out on weekends or grant, gamble or do any of those yeah. things that you know yeah. some people unfortunately yeah. have to deal with. Yeah. Um, my mother had to force him to go <laughs> once a month to the mess and have a beer with somebody, yeah. but that rubs off too because when you when you see Absolutely. your mom doing that. You, you tend to take that with you into adulthood yeah. and, and believe that, you know, sacrifice is good. And I mean, it, I'm sure it can be, but the more I look into what you put out, the more I realize that, that that's not what we're meant to do. And I am so glad you raised that, Elaine. If I can speak to that for a second, because it's something I do Please. feel very passionately about, because it is very challenging to get women over that mindset, to get the mindset shift yeah. there. We are so conditioned to be the caregivers and the nurturers. Yeah. And to be honest, if we're being really ruthlessly honest with ourselves, we've come to a stage where we wear our martyrdom like a badge of honor. Oh, yeah. And, oh, I don't have time to do whatever. And it's like, we're one up. It's like that scene from the movie Jaws, where we're all whipping out our scars, right? <laughs> And so when I try to, to get the only way that I found, or the most effective way that I found to help shift women's mindset on that is to make them see that that martyrdom is actually the most selfish approach that they can take. And they're mm -hmm. like, what are you talking about? Yeah. Think about the role model. Then I'll speak directly to, to your listeners as well. Think about the role model that you're setting when you're sacrificing your needs and taking care of everybody else all the time, putting your dreams on the back burner, your vision on hold, you're basically telling your daughters, 
and all of the other women, young women out there who are looking to you as a role model, that their needs will never be as important as any man in their life. And that is how it perpetuates. And we're teaching our sons and all the young men out there who are watching this pattern play out over and over again, that their needs will always be more important than any woman in their life. And you can see the kind of absolute shock when you frame it to women. It is the most selfish thing you could do. You are setting the worst possible example. That's being a poor role model when you do that. Um, And then you see that mindset shift. So sorry if that seems harsh to the listeners out there, but I think it is long past time that we start shifting out of that mode. We keep talking about empowering young women and getting equality. That will never happen if we keep martyring ourselves, frankly, because we can talk about them being able to achieve anything they want. But if the message that they're really getting when they watch us is, yeah, you can go, and myself, yeah, you can go to law school, you can have a career, but you're going to kill yourself because you need to be the super mom and the super wife and the super career woman. You need to just be super woman. It is, does us such a disservice. It does our society such a disservice. Yeah. So that's absolutely. No, I'm really, (laughs) I'm really glad you, you took that a little farther because it is, I I think it's a, it's a really hard lesson for us to learn and it does make life a great deal easier when you get to that place. I'll, I'll tell you, it's actually kind of funny that my husband grew up in a home where his mother did not fit the pattern of most women. Interesting. And um, as a as a businesswoman, I I found her. Inc- I respected her greatly. Uh, she, you know, she did everything as a business person. Great. As a wife and a mother, it was hard to watch because her needs came first, oh. and it took a long, long time. Yeah. For me to realize, because my husband and his father were made to stand on their own two feet mm-hmm. and do for themselves because she was not their slave. Yeah. She worked. Yeah. She had a job. She yeah. had a career. And she traveled a lot. Wow. And it, it was really interesting because the first few years of our marriage, I didn't know what to do because yeah. <laughs> he, he was always helping do things that like, oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> you know, growing up, we, we came to this country because my parents wanted equality in their marriage and we yeah. didn't get that in Britain. Yeah. But my father would help. He would vacuum if all the curtains were closed and yeah. nobody oh, came to the door. So funny. Yes. You know, because he was <laughs> party trying, secret. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, trying trying the best he could to, to yeah. sort of step up. So she was actually a woman before her time. Yeah, which is really absolutely. quite interesting. Okay. That is interesting. What a great yeah. 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 So one thing I do want to bring up because um Earlier this year, Women on Purpose had their first weekend retreat. Yes. And um, incredible, resounding hurrahs for everything that happened. Are you planning on doing one next year? Yes, I definitely want to have an annual weekend live event, having women come together. It, It was so profound, Elaine, having... You know, by Friday, you had people, you know, a little with the arms crossed when we came yeah. together. The guards were still up a little bit. Sharing was like just there, there took a little finessing to get people to come up to the mic and share. And by Sunday together, it so warmed my heart. There were like women who'd had this, you know, self admitted crusty exterior who were sharing and crying and felt such warmth. And we do exercises together where women who haven't been seen, really seen in a long time, felt seen and the reaction was just so beautiful and profound. So absolutely, definitely gonna do that. I also have mastermind groups where we have sort of mastermind retreats that are a separate thing for people who are in the programs, but the live event is open to the public for any woman who feels like she wants to kick it up to the next level and be able to kickstart rediscovering her purpose and passion. And we throw in a little bit of the art of feminine negotiation as well. So it's, I get a little flavor of both and it's, it's a great event. So, yeah. 
Well, that sounds wonderful. And, and as per usual, we will have all the appropriate links and everything <laughs> on Cindy's show page. Yes. And one thing I wanted to say, because I think it's really useful for women, is the Facebook group. Yes. Uh, women on Purpose, the, the community is very lively and very engaged. And um, I, I'm not quite sure how Cindy manages to get three days into one day every day, <laughs> but she does. <laughs> and uh, yes, I, I guess you're jetting off again soon. I am. I'm doing a little more and more speaking as well, which has been great. Good. But I love it. It's funny, the Facebook page, I'm glad you mentioned that because I, I didn't mention that. And that was one of the first things that I did actually yeah. was to establish. So I've got a Women on Purpose community page, but I also set up a Women on Purpose community group because, and some of the content gets shared is the same, but I find people are much more likely to share intimate details and be more fully engaged and raw and transparent in the group um, because that I the group is met is women only um, the women on purpose page predominantly women but there are men it's open to the public I mean anybody yeah. can come and access it so I so I keep both going I think both have that great value yeah um, you know having the page be open to the public I think the dialogue it's time has come to start having these dialogues yes. more and uh, you know I think if we as we talk about all ships rising we need to be engaging men and women and having Absolutely. coming together and having more understanding and be each other's allies in ways that are more productive and progressive but that group is this safe haven to be able to just share and it's been it's been a joy yeah well i'm glad and and we will definitely uh, put those links up as well um it is it is a closed group and and uh, the women have to apply to get in yeah. which is uh and if filled. you're a woman so long as you are i was yeah i was gonna group, say yeah you're in so i don't want people feeling intimidated it's no 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 you. no no but it, it's the what i meant by that was it you can be assured it is only women because yeah. you're, and you're i personally pre-screen that still yes so, yeah. yeah which is which is fabulous now i i i just have to say thank you because we could be talking forever <laughs> Yes. Anyone who knows me knows I have the most curious mind, so I really like to learn as much as I can about my guests. You have been so kind and considerate and open uh, to everything I've asked, which I really do appreciate. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for everything you do. You're such a supportive advocate for women and women with women-centered businesses. So thank you for that. It is such a blessing to have met you. Well, thank you. And I'm really looking forward to coming to the retreat this year because I wasn't able, to, or next year rather, because I wasn't able to make it this year. Yes. So um, it, it will be very nice uh, to be able to get out and uh, enjoy a different area for a change and get to spend time with uh, a, a whole group of wonderful women. Yeah. Thank you. So for those that are watching, I always ask my guests to leave us with one little um, tip or tweak or trick that you use in your life it can be business or personal, but something that you can use daily that you find very useful. Okay. Oh, I've got so many. So let me see. What's one that's probably one that's so simple, a reframe, is uh, around reframing failure. Um, and That's in particular, I think we so often feel like if we're looking, we see that the world is sort of this linear path. So if I'm here, success is there and failure is over here. So if I make a mistake and I fall down and I fail, we immediately get up and we're mortified and like, oh, I'm moving in the wrong direction. And then so we, we end up turning around and, and we, and in fact, what if the only way to truly get to success is if you go through the yeah. failure because and so that reframe I think is a really important way because you know Abraham Lincoln you know is considered one of the most you know profound you know presidents in the United States history 
most people don't know, he lost, I forget what, like 13 elections yeah. prior to becoming yeah. president, you know, whether it's Edison or, you know, and even abolition, people who've been the biggest game changers in the world have had failures and they learn through those failures. And, and people who've achieved great things have almost only ever done it by having, by failing. So I really encourage certainly my clients and in our community to have what I call fail-abrations, a yes. term that I borrow, which I love. So we do, first, we don't celebrate enough as women for our successes, yeah. but also we have to really start embracing and having these fail-abrations where we're actually excited about the prospect. Okay, I just had this epic failure. So what can I learn from that? Okay, I'm not going to sit and wither. I'm not going to turn in the other direction and sort of get away from it. I am going to learn from this uh, encounter. And uh, what's the message in here? How can I make things better? And tied to that, so I would say fail abrations are the one really easy like tip that. to apply in your yep. life. And tied to that, I love the go for no tip, which comes from a book by Richard Fenton of the same name. So I think we have so much pressure and women in particular have such baggage around being rejected that oh, we yeah. don't ask. And yeah. it holds us back in life. You know, 62% of men who get offered a job, uh, a particular starting salary in a job, 62% of men will ask Absolutely. for more money as compared to 7% of women. Those figures just wow. are staggering to me, 7%. Oh. So we need to start asking. So probably one of the biggest tips tied to reframing failure is to get over that fear of rejection. And the easiest way I have found to do that is by going for no. So let's say, let's use sales as the easiest example. So if you need a particular quota to, you know, whether you're selling a program or selling something, instead of going, oh, okay, I need to get 10 sales this week. And to get 10 sales, I'm going to have to cold call probably 100 people to be able to get those 10 sales. We're already going in with this trepidation about, oh, I need that yes, I need that yes. And it creates all this resistance in us. If you flip that on its head and decide, I'm going to go for the no. I'm going for 100 no's this week. Now you don't have any of that resistance. When you get the no, it's like, okay, but it keeps That's you great. driving forward as opposed yeah. to if you're going for 10 yeses and we get three yeses earlier in the week, we tend to take our foot off the pedal. Whereas if you're going for a hundred no's, even after you've got 10, 20, 30 no's, you're like, keep going. I yeah. got to keep going. And it takes all the angst out of it. Because, and then when you get those yeses, they're an absolute bonus, right? Yeah. So, and that's about just being really intentional, which is one of the things I really, my, the purpose planner is intended to reset that kind of thinking and framework. So you're bringing intention to how you approach every day, every week, every month with your resetting your priorities. So hopefully those two little tips are helpful. They are perfect because they led me into what I wanted to close with. Cindy and Cindy's daughter, Jade, have come up with an incredible purpose planner. Mm -hmm. This is something that's really so different because it's not about ticking off all the stupid little go to the dry cleaners and change the bed, yada, yada. <laughs> it's none of that stuff. Yeah. It's about your vision, your mission, your, your what, what gets you out of bed in the morning and why you why you want to do those things. Absolutely. Absolutely. This planner is brand spanking new. And as of tomorrow, since it's Black Friday, yes, we're going to actually be putting that out there. And uh, the pre-order, because I believe it's due in January, am I correct? Yeah, we're hoping to get it before so we could send them out so that people will receive. So if they want to give them as gifts, they can have the gift and it'll get sent directly to whoever you're gifting. So you can Perfect. start your January. You know, the idea is to kickstart the year with this new, totally new approach to how you plan your time. Perfect. Perfect. So on that note, uh, the planner is absolutely gorgeous. I will make sure that the links are up for the planner as well. Uh, so that people can go take a look at that. I think it's a really great uh, point for women to do something that is this little bit different. And I think the most um, 
what rang really different for me was the fact that you talk about women being uh, moon and water beings. Mm, yes. and, and that that in itself is what really makes it stand out. Thank you. I love that because we, we've gotten away from that. I think we were like historically, yeah. like women, we are, you know, we're, we're water. We're so pulled by the moon and by the lunar cycles Cycle. and by the yeah. ocean occurrence. And we've lost our connection from that because I think we've lost our feminine power. You know, we, we hold such power if we just trust in it. And so I wanted to get away from that to do, which is a more, you know, masculine approach to life. Again, this very task driven, I need to get all of this stuff done. And yeah. because women tend to feel the need to take care of everybody, we fill up our days with all of these tasks and errands, almost none of which have anything to do with our real priorities in life. We, we don't spend the kind of quality time with our intimate partner or even our kids sometimes that we'd like to, because we're so busy taking care of these to do's every day. Yeah. So this the idea behind this that we feel so passionately about is to flip that on its head. So every day you answer a series of questions. You know, what bold step can I take today? You know, these, yeah. these kinds of things. Do a worry dump to get them off your head. How do I want to show up today? Most yeah. people don't start their day with that kind of intention about how do you want to show up? How do you want to present to the world? What do you want to achieve of your priorities? So it's just this very different perspective to, uh, to a planner. We Excellent. hope. hope. Excellent. Well, I love the fact that, that it is so different. It is so feminine based, which really does make it stand apart. Thank you. You're very welcome. So on that note, I want to say thank you so much for being my guest. Thank you. It's uh, incredibly lovely to have you here. With that in mind, I want to say make the rest of your day amazing. As usual, I'm Elaine Lindsay with my guest, Cindy Watson, and we'll see you next time. Brought to you by BBP TV Show and Truel Social, helping small biz navigate the digital world.